I sat down, took out some sheets of paper, and began with the first thing that occurred to me, without knowing what would follow, without any sort of plan. My characters will go about constructing themselves according to how they act and speak, above all, how they speak. Their personalities will form little by little, and sometimes their personality will be that of not having one. Miguel de Unamuno, Niebla. Hi there! Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's most important novel. Things get very strange in Chapter 59 of Don Quixote Part 2. Our heroes find a clear and fresh spring, it's another locus amenus. When the squire begins to eat, the Hidalgo produces another of his long-winded contrasts between them. I, Sancho, was born to live by dying and you to die by eating. Don Quixote's double paradox encapsulates the contrastive nature of Cervantes' project. The first phrase echoes the idea of embracing life through death in both medieval courtly love poetry as well as late Renaissance mystical poetry. The second phrase is a comical mockery of them both. As another indication of the darker tone of the 1615 novel, Don Quixote now contemplates suicide. I think I shall let myself die from hunger, death most cruel of deaths. Sancho's objection is down to earth. I at least have no plan to kill myself. Rather, I'd sooner do as the shoemaker does when he pulls at the leather with his teeth until he makes it reach where he wants. Shoes again. He talks Don Quixote out of suicide. There is no greater madness than wanting to commit suicide. And he suggests sleep instead. The narrator again highlights Sancho's wisdom by telling us that Don Quixote thinks Sancho's reasoning was more that of a philosopher than an idiot. Hilariously, Don Quixote tells Sancho that while his master sleeps, the squire should give himself 300 or 400 lashes toward the 3,000 and some odd that you must give yourself for the disenchantment of Dulcinea. Sancho remains skeptical and delays the idea. There is much still to be said about that. This notion of a man lashing himself in cold blood is a very serious matter. Did you know suicide is a sin according to the Catholic Church? Now we read a brief episode in the novel's fourth inn. The narrator hints that Don Quixote's madness is abating. I say that it was an inn because Don Quixote called it as much, straying from the habit that he had of calling all inns castles. Sancho is happy that Don Quixote acts rational for once. Presumably, their stay will go smoothly. Indeed, when Sancho asks the innkeeper about dinner, his response bodes well. The host responded that his mouth would be satisfied. This recalls for informed readers Lazarillo's achievement of prosperity in the sixth chapter of El Lazarillo de Tormes, after a comic interlude in which the innkeeper denies every dish that Sancho requests, like Pedro Recio. The host finally offers him two cow's feet. Again, this is exactly what Lazarillo and the Hidalgo eat in the first picaresque novel. Notice also how Sancho eagerly pays for his meal. I claim them as mine from here, and nobody touch them, for I'll pay more for them than anybody else. Commerce offers hope. When Don Quixote sits down to eat in a very deliberate fashion, Cervantes throws us into another of those meta-literary mise en moments that anticipate a favorite trope of modernist literature. Don Quixote overhears two men discussing the second part of Don Quixote of La Mancha, and he is shocked. As soon as Don Quixote heard his name, he stood up and listened intently to what they were saying about him. Don Quixote is further startled when these two nobles, Don Juan and Don Jerónimo, mention that the author of this book paints Don Quixote as no longer in love with Dulcinea of Toboso. Infuriated, Don Quixote shouts through the walls that Don Quixote could never forget Dulcinea, and he challenges anyone who claims that he could. The others shout back, who is answering us? 
Now Sancho responds that it's Don Quixote himself. Note how during this exchange between two separate rooms in the inn, the verb to respond occurs three times in 10 words. The novel these two gentlemen are reading is Avellaneda's apocryphal continuation from 1614, which makes this an amazing moment in Don Quixote as well as the entire history of the novel form. One of the two men actually places the book in Don Quixote's hands. Now, we have read about characters who have read part one, but this is the first time that characters have read the other part two. They now discuss and debate the contents of Avellaneda's book. It's all lighthearted. Cervantes clearly delights in the opportunity to create even more mind-boggling textual problems. For example, Don Quixote notes that the language of part two sounds too Aragonese and that the author confuses a major aspect of the story when he calls Sancho's wife Mari Gutierrez. But what Don Quixote claims to be examples of Aragonese diction are in fact not so. And Cervantes himself already mixed up Teresa's name in chapter seven of part one, not only calling her Mari Gutierrez, but also Juana Panza. As another example, the men claim Avianeda calls Sancho a drunkard. But in this episode, Cervantes has Sancho drink the innkeeper under the table and remain unfazed like a new version of Socrates in Plato's Symposium. Quixotic Mission. Why does Don Quixote get angry with the two noblemen who have been reading Avellaneda's novel? A, they are Protestants. B, they want to charge him for his meal. C, they claim he is no longer in love with Dulcinea. Correct answer, C, they claim he is no longer in love with Dulcinea. Nevertheless, Cervantes now makes a clear distinction between his narrative and Avellaneda's by having Don Quixote renounce his journey to Zaragoza. I will not set foot in Zaragoza and thus I will leave the lie of this modern historian where the whole world can see it and people will realize that I am not the Don Quixote that he says I am. This is very weird. Without Avellaneda, Cervantes might not have finished his novel, and he certainly could not have produced this kind of wildly creative exchange. Thus, we sense respect, even gratitude, on the part of Cervantes. There seems something deeper at work, something anti-imperial in this chapter. One of the gentlemen observes that Don Quixote is to Alexander the Great as the writer Thidiamete is to the painter Apelles. In other words, a loyal critic. Also, by not going to Zaragoza, Don Quixote seems to reject Castile's conquest of Aragon in 1591. Consider also the highly charged Latin phrase that the narrator now uses to describe Sancho sitting down to his meal, con mero mixto imperio, a legalistic phrase meaning with full political and juridical powers. Finally, note the ultimate turn to commerce, suggesting a new Alexander. Sancho paid the innkeeper magnificently. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.